God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> well, we're going to continue our study on the love of God. We've been studying the love of God. We've looked at the, the um, God's love. We, we see that throughout the Bible. It's all about God's love. It's a revelation of Jesus. And if it's good, it's God. If it isn't good, it isn't God. And sometimes people say, well, Jesus went about doing good, but that was just to prove who he was. But God does one thing, Jesus does another. But God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus said, I only do those things that I see my Father do, and I only do those things that please my Father, and I only say those things that I hear him say. So we saw what love looks like. Love looks like Jesus. And that's the Father's will, plan, and purpose for man for all time. So we looked at that. And let's once again read the meaning. I got this, as I said, from Rick Renner. In the Hebrew, the, Greek, the Hebrew word is hasid for God's love. And in the Greek, it's agape. And in the Old Testament, it's been translated the Hasid word, the word for love, Hasid, has been translated love, compassion, loving kindness, goodness. So when we see these words, sometimes we can see compassion, we might see goodness, but it's really talking about the love, God's love. And God doesn't have love, he is love. So God can't stop himself from doing and being and acting love because he is love. There is never any hate in God because hate and love can't coexist and God is love. He doesn't love one minute and the next minute not. When you are something, I am a woman and I don't change from a woman to a man to a dog to a cat, whichever mood I'm in. I am and God is love. So he doesn't change. He is love. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the meaning, agape, or hasid, is a divine love that gives and gives and gives. Now, this is talking about our Heavenly Father. This is what he's like. Even if it's never responded to, thanked, or acknowledged. You could say that agape is a love that isn't based on response, but on a decision to keep on loving regardless of a recipient's response or lack of response. Agape is an unconditional love. It always gives and is a servant. The all-consuming love of God is a giving love. Human love expects a return. God doesn't. So that's so freeing to know it doesn't depend on me. God loves me. He just loves me. It's not up to me. He loves me. I can do nothing to make him love me more or to make him love me less. He loves me. Because he is love. Now, if I do something dumb, I'm, if I go out and rob a bank, God loves me, but I'm going to pay the price. I get caught, I'm going to jail. God still loves me, but I paid a price. I stepped out into Satan's territory and I'm paying a price. But God loves me. Whether I rob a bank or I don't rob a bank, God loves me. Amen. And that's important for us to know. Because too often, because of background or perhaps parents or the way we were raised or the way friends or other people respond to us they only love us when we behave and act right if I follow a certain set of rules I've got your love I've got your approval and so we sort of transfer that love to our Heavenly Father and figure he's got to be the same way because maybe that's the only thing we knew but he's not like that isn't that good news Oh, that's such good news. I so am so, so thankful that he just, bottom line, loves me. When I get up in the morning and I, hair's here, he loves me. With or without my face on, he loves me. He loves me, just bottom line, loves me. And that's good news to me. Why, I remember this number of years ago, I was going to go out with... Um, Actually, I was just going to drive my youngest son somewhere. I said, okay, let's go. He says, Mom, don't you think you should put a face on first? 
My goodness, son, you're only about 19. You think your mother needs a face on. I said, well, all right, I'm just driving you. He says, well, you might be coming out with me, you know. I say, yeah. Anyway, you know, but God loves me. Not that he didn't love me with or without my face. But I can go out for God without a face on, and he still loves me. He loves me. Whether you men have shaved in the morning or not, he loves you. That's so good because our society, and the reason I point that out, our society is so based on how you look, what clothes you wear, whether your house is right or it's wrong or your car is right or it's wrong. So much of society bases what we, whether we're accepted to them or not by our job or, or our education or, or our amount of money. But that makes no difference to our Heavenly Father because he sees us in Jesus. He sees us in Jesus. And isn't that good news? Oh, that's such good news. Glory to God. So then we also saw that um, Jesus came to give us abundant life only and that Jesus defeated Satan by doing good. You know, it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance, not the hor- trying to preach horror to people or hell and damnation to people. It's just the goodness of God leads to repentance. It's the goodness of God. When people find out how good he is, how much he loves them, you just can't stay away from him. You just want him. You just want him. So we found that Jesus was moved with compassion, that love sent Jesus across the lake for one man to set the demoniac free. And if Jesus went across the lake, he only did what he saw his father do. So his father wanted him to go across the lake to help one man to help that one demoniac. That was the Father's will. One man. So we looked at that. We looked at the fact we saw that God loves us as much as he loves Jesus. Last week we saw that we are in the beloved. And God is not judging us today based on us. You know, God's not the judge right now. There will be a judgment later. And, and, and the judgment of the Christian is, is um, whether what we did in this body, whether we fulfilled the plan and purpose God had for us, has for us. That's, that's, but it's not for sins or condom or any of that. The world will be judged. What is the world judged on? They're not judged whether they're a murderer or a rapist. That's not what they're judged on. The world's going to be judged whether they made Jesus Christ the Lord of their life or not. That's the only thing. And the Christian's judgment, it's not so much a judgment, but a rewards time if you fulfilled the plan that God has for your life, what you did in this earth. We're not going to get there, and he's not going to say, well, you didn't read all you should have. You didn't study all you should have. You didn't give as much as you should have. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't. No, he's not going to do that. He's going to say, this is the plan I had for you. You fulfilled it. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what it is. We sort of think we're going to go there. And if I I forgot to confess a sin, and what's going to happen to me now? I died. Jesus' blood has covered my sins. Maybe I didn't know it was a sin. No, God's not like that. People might be like that, but God's not like that. It says God is not judging us today based on us. He has placed us in Christ, in the anointed one, and he sees the excellence, the beauty, and perfection of Jesus when he looks at us. Now, isn't that wonderful? He sees Jesus when he looks at us. And all that Jesus is, God has set to our account because we're joint heirs. Because we're joint heirs. So we saw that last week. We saw that we could come boldly to the throne of grace to receive mercy. So we're going to continue that study, the impact of love on our life. It's something we should think about, the love of God. Think about it lots. Meditate on it lots because it changes your life. There's such a freedom in knowing 
the love of God and understanding it. In fact, we had seen in one of our earlier studies that it says, when we know the length, the breadth, the depth, the height of God's love, we'll be filled with the fullness of God. So we need a revelation knowledge of God himself and of his love. So we can be filled with the fullness of God. So we're looking at that some more today. Let's go to Romans chapter 5, please. Romans chapter 5. The impact that God's love has on our life. Romans chapter 5. Now it starts, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore. Now whenever you see a therefore, find out what it's there for. There's a reason why Paul said therefore. And the reason is he was talking about Abraham. He wrote the, the Romans about Abraham. How Abraham was barren, and he had an Ishmael, but then he talked about how this child came about, how, how Isaac came about. I'm just going to flip back to chapter 4, verse 16, therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. And not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now remember, it was the promise was made to the seed. One singular, it talks about in Galatians, Jesus. And we're in him. Remember, we're in Christ. This is so important to always remember, we're in Christ. We're in Jesus. We're his body. So when it talks about what Jesus has in this life, it's what we have. Because we're in him. So this is for us. And then it says, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed. Even God who quickens the dead and calleth, calleth when you call something you're saying words. The law of confession. Calleth. God calls those things which be not as though they were. What in your life is not and you want it to be? Is there a healing? then you call it healed. Is it prosperity? Is it, is it a job? Whatever it is, you call it. You call what is not as though it was. It doesn't say call what you have. You call those things that be not. Paul is saying in Romans 5, therefore, why? Why is he saying therefore? Because of this, because of this situation here, now they were talking about the impact of the love of God. This has got to do with God's love. Call those things that be not as though they were. So this is what Abraham started to do. He said, I'm a father of many nations. See, he cut a covenant with God. God took the H out of his name, put it in Abram's name, and he became Abraham. Put an H from God's name, put it on the end of Sarai, and she became Sarah. When you cut covenant, you have a name exchange. So now Abraham's talking like God. Well, we can talk like God because we're in Jesus. We're in Jesus. Jesus only spoke those things he heard the Father say. We can speak only those things we hear our Father say. So Abraham did that. Who in against hope believed in hope? Now, hope means expectation. So here he's saying, who against human expectation? Who against all possibility of expectation? He couldn't even expect to have a son. Believed in hope. Believed in the expectation. He believed in it anyway. You might look at your situation and say, there's just no hope in this situation. But in God, there is. Because anything that isn't give you life is not God. If it isn't bringing life, resurrection, Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Everywhere he went, he brought resurrection power. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that resurrection power dwells in each one of us. If you're born again, it's in the body. So everywhere we go, we bring resurrection life to every situation. So we bring life to dead situations, as Jesus did. So we can hope against hope. Against human hope, it seems impossible. But my expectation in the gospel of Christ goes over and above that. See, whatever Jesus did, he did for me. He didn't do for himself. We're talking about the impact of love in our life. So this is what he's saying there. Then not being weak in faith, he considered not his own body. 
It's time we quit considering ourselves and our situation and what we can do in ourselves, because what we need is beyond ourselves. But we're in Christ, so it's not beyond us because it's not beyond him. Like Peter was sharing this morning, we're of a different system. When we consider ourselves and what we can do, it's just not enough. It's just not enough. It's not enough. But when we consider what Jesus did, it's more than enough, and we're going to see that. Hallelujah. So that's why Paul is saying, therefore, verse 24 of 4, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now you say, well, there's an if. I don't know if I believe. Are you born again? If you're born again, you're a believer. If you're born again, you believe. You can't stop being a believer. Unbelief is not not believing. Unbelief is believing the wrong thing. Unbelief is believing something contrary to the word of God. We're believers. People believe something. Either you're a believer in God or you're a believer in Satan or you're a believer in, in the swine flu or you're a believer in the healing. You're a believer. You believe something. So we might say unbelief, but all unbelief is is believing something opposite than the word of God. You're still believing something. So we are believers. But if we're a believer, we're believers. If you're born again, you're a believer. Who was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification? Now back to 5.1. Therefore, he's saying, therefore, because of all of that, because of what I told you about Abraham and how he walked and what he got and by faith and you're in him and that's the seed. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The message translation says, by entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us. God always wanted to do this. Genesis, the first two chapters, is God's will for mankind for all time. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with him. God set us right with him. We don't set ourselves right with God. Love set us right with God. Love did it. We have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. We have it all together with God because of Jesus. You see, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking to him. Jesus said to Peter, you're blessed because my father has revealed it to you. Revealed what? Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. When we get a revelation of Jesus, we get a revelation of it all. Because Sickness and disease was put on Jesus. If we don't have a revelation of Jesus and that he died for that, we won't have it. It's still all Jesus. It's still Jesus. It's not us. It's still Jesus. Everything is in him. We're in him. Verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace. We saw that last week. Come boldly to the throne room of grace where we can find help in time of need. Well, here it's saying, by faith into this grace, divine favor. Now, there's a whole deal about faith. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. We're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourself, it's a gift of God. What's the gift? The grace, the faith, and the salvation. It's all a gift. So if Jesus authored our faith, you see, God put that faith in us. It came from hearing the word. We heard somebody preach the love message, the gospel. God sent out a preacher. We heard it. And sometimes it takes a long time, many times of hearing it. But that's the Holy Spirit. What happens? You didn't just all of a sudden become so smart. Now, I believe I'm going to get born again. No. You have to believe in your heart, not in your head. In your heart. It says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. So what happens? You hear the gospel preached, the message of love. And the Holy Spirit witnesses it to your heart. That's a gift. 
And you get faith from the word that the Holy Spirit witnessed to your heart. And what do we do? All we do is confess. Say, Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. That's it. Everything else is God. Now, that faith that you got wasn't your faith. It was a gift. Now, God's word is faith. This word is impregnated with faith, with love. So when we take this word in, and, and I've and so many times, I would say to somebody, they're, they're sick or healing, and I would say, need healing I'd say by the stripes of Jesus you're healed and they go yeah I know that no but by his stripes you were healed you were healed I know that you see it's in the head and we've gone through this because in our society especially everything's head knowledge we so center in on rote learning and head knowledge and what we need is to let the Holy Spirit give us revelation knowledge of that word we cannot get revelation knowledge on our own. And we have a set of CDs out there. Revelation knowledge. The Holy Spirit gives us that. That's why Paul in the Ephesian prayers was praying and saying that the, you may have the eyes of your understanding enlightened. What is that? Our spirit man enlightened so we may know what is the length, the breadth, the depth, the height, the width of the love of God. The depth that goes so low, so far down, it doesn't matter how far we go down, his love is there. Psalm 139, not 139. Anyway, no matter where I am, David said, yes, it's 139. No matter where I am, your love is there. If I go into the deepest parts of the earth, your love is there. And height, it brings me up. And it's, it reaches out to everyone. There isn't a single person that God doesn't love. So this is what he's talking about there. Faith comes by hearing the word. Hearing and hearing, Romans says. That means you hear it, you pray, you believe, you ask the Holy Spirit to give you revelation, knowledge, and all of a sudden you will go, did you see that? And then you get all excited and you share it with somebody else. Usually this happens with the husband and wife. One or the other will get it and you'll say, look it. And they'll go, yeah, I know. I've seen that. Yeah, I've, I've read that before. Yeah, but because they didn't get a revelation on that particular one. Then they'll come back with something else. Somebody will come. And they, you, I didn't get a revelation on that. And I still don't. But hey, this sounds good. And you wait on it. And you get it in. And you believe God. And you let the Holy Spirit give you revelation. That's how love will impact your life. It'll impact your life. And there's nothing you have to do to get God to love you. Now, I may have shared this before. I don't know. I have shared it in some meetings. But when we first found out about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, my, 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 I wanted that. I had never heard anybody speak in tongues. But I read the book, The Cross and the Switchblade. Now, you see, in those days, I smoked. Not marijuana, cigarettes. I smoked. I, I got to realize now, sometimes when you tell somebody you smoke, they might think it's marijuana. But I didn't know about marijuana. I hadn't even heard of it back then. Anyway, I smoked. And so I saw how these guys in the cross and the switchblade, when, when David Wilkerson was there, they got delivered. They got filled with the Holy Spirit, and they got delivered from all these habits, drugs and stuff. And I thought, well, certainly, if I got that, I could get rid of the cigarettes. I had an ulterior motive. That's what I wanted it for. And it was causing some unrest in the home when one person smokes and the other doesn't. It's not always a good idea. So anyway... I thought, you know, okay, God, I, if you'll just fill me with the Holy Spirit, I, I mean, I'll quit smoking. What else do I have to? See, I tried to earn it. I thought I had to get myself good enough for something. So this went on and through a process, and, and then, you know, sometimes a language would come, and, and it was a language that I had when every so often as I was growing up and when I was sort of pretending whatever, and I thought, nah. But I remember this time so clearly. 
children were playing in another room and I was sitting there and um, I was sitting there and I had my Bible. I had my coffee and my cigarette and I was in my bay window. The sun was shining in and it was so comfortable. Just me. The kids were just doing their thing and I was sitting there. And so I asked for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and the sun was shining in. It was nice. But all of a sudden, it became so bright. It was so light. And I was sitting there with my Bible, talking to my Heavenly Father, having my coffee, having my cigarette. And he said to me, Arlene, I love you no matter what you do, unconditionally. I love you. And it was the first time that I can remember in my life, and I know I was, but it just so impacted me that for the first time I thought, I'm love for me unconditionally. It impacted my life. And I continued smoking for a period of time. I got filled with the Holy Spirit, started speaking in tongues right at that point. But all of a sudden I realized I didn't have to do anything to please my father. But I realized that was an open door to Satan. Now, if anybody's ever smoked here, you know, you can just not even be thinking about having a cigarette, busy doing something good, and all of a sudden you'll feel this pressure. Satan can put a thought in your mind, you need a cigarette, and your body will just go nuts. It'll need it. Right now, you've got to go out, do whatever you need it. Go through 15 feet of snow. I mean, you know, you can't go anywhere else, couldn't go to church, but I mean, if you needed a cigarette, you could get through 15 feet of snow. And I realized how that was an avenue Satan could use. And love had set me free. Jesus bore that for me. So I didn't need it. And that was it. That was it. Was it easy? Well, any time I wanted it, I just saw my Jesus. I just saw what he did for me. You see, that's how love impacts your life. It'll just get rid of anything you don't need. It'll give you revelation knowledge. But I knew I didn't have to do anything to earn his love. Now that was good because I had been trying to do that. You see, he loves us. This is what it says. By faith. Where did I get that faith from? It was the witness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave me that. That's what we need. We can't work it up. Even when you're praying in tongues, you're praying and praying and praying and praying and praying, and all of a sudden you're just exhausted. But you know if you just let the Holy Spirit do it and follow him, you'll never get tired. You can just keep going. You can just keep going. Oh, God is so good. Back to chapter 5, verse 3. Well, yeah, verse 3. And not only so, but we glory or joy in tribulations. And that means pressure. When pressure comes on you. You see, I had pressure to have a cigarette. But I could have joy because I knew I was delivered. I could rejoice in that, that I was delivered. You see, whatever. I don't have the finances. When we went through that, I could have joy because I knew that it says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. I knew it. I knew it was going to get to us. I didn't know how, but we rejoiced in that. And, and we had enough. I knew it. I just knew it. Because my God's a good God. You see? So you could joy. You can laugh at it. You can just shout the glory all the way. Give him praise and honor because you know what his word says. That's how love will impact your life. Because when you understand love of God, you will understand God and you know he does nothing but good. All the time, all the time, all the time. And if it isn't good in your life, it's not God. And you say, well, he might be teaching me something. Well, hey, get smart real quick and learn it. And if the teacher of the church is not Satan, and it's not sickness, and it's not disease, and it's not poverty. It says the Holy Spirit's our teacher. Amen. And if Jesus went about doing good, anointed by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's not going to come along and break somebody's leg. It's not going to happen, because God didn't go about breaking legs. 
so we can shout glory. In time of famine, shout glory. Praise him and honor him for his love and his goodness. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Okay, well, that was um, verse 3 of the message of this. We're still in Romans 5. There's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us. Patience is endurance. And it says, when patience or endurance has its perfect work, you will be entire, lacking and wanting nothing. That's a good place to be. Is there anybody here that wants some things? Well, when patience has its perfect work, we will be entire, lacking nothing, wanting nothing. Hallelujah. Because then that's what it's saying is when it, Satan comes to try and steal, kill, and destroy, when we endure with the word, looking to Jesus, standing on the love, believing in the love, being filled with the fullness of the love, that devil's got to go and stop it. Fear is false evidence appearing real, is all it is. What you worry about has not come to pass. You're worrying about false evidence appearing real, which is fear. Verse 4, and patience, experience, and experience hope. Verse 5, and hope, expectation, makes not ashamed. The message says, in alert expectancy such as this, we're never left feeling short-changed. Quite the contrary, we can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. Remember the widow with needed oil? Could she get enough containers? If she had found more, the oil would have kept going. Verse 5, and hope makes not ashamed. What does ashamed? It's to dishonor or bring disgrace. So expectancy on God's word will cause us to rise above the trials we might see have, and we will not be ashamed, meaning we will not be brought to dishonor or disgrace. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the power of God for healing, prosperity, preservation. We will not, when we stand on the love of God, we'll not be ashamed. Whatever we're expecting... What we're hoping for, see, faith is a substance of things hoped for. We've got to hope for something. It says we'll not be ashamed because Jesus already won the battle. If we'll stand against that enemy, we'll not be ashamed. Then it says, King James, why won't we be ashamed? Because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. See, now, we don't even work for the love of God. It's put in our hearts. How? By the Holy Spirit, which, when Jesus went to heaven, asked the Father to send. And then we ask for the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes into our life. Shed abroad. The whole love of God has been shed abroad. That means shed abroad is to pour out. The love of God has been poured out, shed forth, bestowed, distributed largely, and is gushing out of our hearts. No one here, if you're born again, has any shortage of love. God's love. God's love. Not man's love. God's love. And remember, why won't we be ashamed? It's just because the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart. And this is how it impacts our life. Because it says the love of God never fails. And the love of God never fails. It's because God never fails and God is love. So if we've got the love of God shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost, we can't go under for going over. Because God's love never fails. As long as we... Don't try and take the reins and do it in the natural human way of doing things. Amen. 
That love is in us. God is in us. His love has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Just poured out. It's gushing. Just when you think of yourself, think of the love of God gushing out of you. That's, that'll impact your life. It impacted mine. It really impacted mine. Did I ever dip after that? I mean, I shouldn't even say dip because that's got another connotation too. Did I ever mess, mess up? I didn't smoke again, if the, but... You know, did I ever get out of the love? Yeah. Did I ever think I needed somebody to, a human being, to show approval to me, to make me feel good again? Yeah, I did. You slip back into that. And then the Holy Spirit gently reminds you, hey, you don't need somebody to think you're great. You don't need somebody to approve of you. I approve of you. Now, you walk in that love of mine. You walk in that love of mine, and whether somebody approves of you or not doesn't matter. I approve of you, and as you do what I'm telling you to do, as you walk in that, as you get a revelation of that, and you walk in God's love, you'll never fail. You'll never fail. You'll never fail. Glory be to God. Verse 6. Now this is, For when we were yet without strength, when we were weak in time, due time, Christ died for the ungodly message Christ arrives right on time to make this happen again it's not us that makes it happen it's all God he didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready he presented himself for this sacrificial death when we were far too weak and rebellious to do anything to get ourselves ready and even if we hadn't been so weak we wouldn't have known what to do anyway if we didn't have the gospel revealed to us, we wouldn't have known how to get born again. We wouldn't have known what to do. Wouldn't have had the sense to get born again. Wouldn't have even known there was such a thing. I mean, there's so many testimonies of people, and I've read them in, in, in Africa, where they've just, is there a God? And all of a sudden, they've walked for days to go to a Reinhard Bonnke meeting. There's times when people have been translated to go witness to somebody because they cried out, is there a God? Show me if you're there. Well, that had, that's scriptural. Philip went to the Ethiopian eunuch, didn't he? He was wanting to know. He need, was reading Isaiah. Is there something here? And he got born again, baptized. Every person, I honestly believe, there won't, every person that ever has a cry out to God in any way that cry will be answered. Whether it's leading them, an angel leading them to a meeting, the Holy Spirit just saying, hey, see that sign, Living Word Christian Center? You just come on in. Or translating somebody to them. Not one person will be able to stand before God and say, I didn't know and didn't have an opportunity to get born again. There won't be a single one. Not one. Because if there's one, God is no longer a righteous God. So there won't be one. That's love. Isn't that good? That's so good. If you wonder about your family, not one of them will die before they will have had an opportunity to hear about Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when we weren't ready, verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. So who's going to die for an, a worthless person, an ungodly person? Message says, we can understand someone dying for a person worth dying for, and we can understand how someone good and noble could inspire us to selfish sacrifice. You can understand maybe somebody dying for a good person. But it doesn't make sense for someone to die for someone that's worthless. And that's what we were. But love reached down for God so loved the world. Verse 8. But, boy, what a mess we did. But, but God, but love commanded his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. 
We didn't have to get ourselves good enough. I've heard this where people were, have been told, like, if you quit all this junk that you're into, if you quit it all, you have to give up all this stuff, then when you give it up, you can get born again. Well, my goodness, if we could get rid of all that stuff ourselves, we wouldn't need Jesus. It's because we can't do anything is why we need him. God commanded his love to us. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use to him whatsoever. Now, isn't that wonderful? It also makes us look at people in a different light. Now we can see where we learned that when people see this love, God in us and us in him, it'll cause unity in the body. And the world will see it and know that God is truly here. That God sent Jesus. Verse 9. Much more. Everybody say, much more. Much more. more. Hallelujah. Then being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We have much more. Now that we are set right with God by means of this sacrificial death, the consummate blood sacrifice, there is no longer a question of being at odds with God in any way. We have peace with God. We've been reconciled. This is the impact of love. We've got to think of these things. It'll impact our life. It'll cause us to think differently. When we see a situation that's in our life or somebody else's life that doesn't, isn't of God, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. There will never, ever, 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 ever be a question in our mind, could this be God? There will never be a question is, I wonder why God won't answer their prayer. We know what love is like. We've been too focused on what we can do instead of focused on what He's already done. Much more. Verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled shall we be saved, saved, sozo, healed, delivered, preserved, prosperous in this life. Much more. There is much more life in Jesus than there was death in Adam. Much more. I mean, the same amount would be good. If there was just enough life to cancel out Adam's, the death from Adam, that would be good, wouldn't it? That's good. But it says there's much more life in Jesus than there was death in Satan, in Adam. Verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for all that sin. So it just went on and it goes on. Let's go down to verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. It's free to us. Cost Jesus his life. He bore it all, but he was raised. But it's a free gift to us. God's grace, God's favor, his mercy, his compassion, his love is a free gift to us. For if through the offense of one many died, much more the grace the favor of God, and the gift of grace. Again, it's a gift, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded, abounded, abounded. Abounded means to exceed a fixed number of measure. In abundance till it overflows. To be left over and above a certain number or measure. The love, the grace, the mercy that we got through Jesus overflows in our life. Overflows in our life. The message says, yet the rescuing gift is not exactly parallel to the death-dealing sin. It's not parallel. It doesn't run parallel. If one man's sin put crowds of people at the dead end abyss of separation from God, just think what God's gift His love poured through one man, Jesus Christ, will do. 
If Adam sinned, so much things could happen. Just think how much more, how much more good through Jesus. Verse 16, not as if it was by one that sinned, so it is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Free gift. Oh, this love of God is a free gift. It's so important for us to realize that because when we think we have to do something to earn it or to keep it, it's no longer a free gift. And when we mess up, Satan is going to jump all over us and we are going to get condemned. It says that God does not condemn. God, the Holy Spirit doesn't condemn. The Holy Spirit, in, and you read verses 14, chapter 14, 15, 16 of John, the Gospel of John. The Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. The world of sin. The Holy Spirit doesn't convict the believer of sin. Well, what happens if I sin? In 1 John it says, if our heart condemn us not. If our heart condemn us not. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit. It says in, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. 1 John, if our heart condemn us not. It's not God out there convicting us. It's not the Holy Spirit convicting us. And that whole goofy stuff that was going around where the Holy Spirit reveals to you all this stuff from the past is a lie from the pit of hell. And the Holy Spirit will not convict the sinner of all this stuff back there either. He convicts them of righteousness, of his need for Jesus. So if some thought comes up in your mind of something and you don't even remember, I don't remember doing that, well, I better just forget it. It's not God. It's not the Holy Spirit. Check it out. It's in there. It's our heart that will condemn us. If we miss it, it's our heart. But a lot of times, we, it's not even our heart. It's just our head because we've allowed some thought to come in and fester in our mind and make us feel unworthy. We're talking about love impacting our lives. This will impact the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we think. Verse 17. For if by one man's offense, meaning Adam's, death reigned, and it did. Once Adam sinned, death reigned in man. Death was a king. Much more. Again, I just love this, much more. God's just always much more. Just much more. They which receive abundance of grace, God's divine favor, and the gift of righteousness. Now, righteousness is right standing with God. Once you've got it, once you're born again, you have right standing with God and you don't lose it. You are made, according to Corinthians, you're made the righteousness of God in Christ. You're made righteous. And when you're made righteous, you don't lose it. From now until you go to heaven, you're righteous. And when you're in heaven, you're righteous. When you got born again, you were made the righteousness of God in Christ and you don't lose it. Love made us righteous. Love gave us right standing with God. That's what that means. The message said, if death got the upper hand through one man's wrongdoing, can you imagine the breathtaking recovery Life makes sovereign life in those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life gift, this grand setting everything right, that the one man, Jesus Christ, provides. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory. And it says we shall, what? Reign in life. We shall reign in life. What does that mean? Who reigns? Kings. We have been made kings and priests. Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. 
We are kings. And what do kings do? Kings decree. Remember, I said, God calls those things that be not as though they were. God decrees. And we're to be imitators of God as dear children. So we as kings decree a thing. Well, when we were in, in um, Milwaukee this year, and on Wednesday night we, we, we played the uh, Jerry Seville tape, he said kings also veto. Kings veto. We did some vetoing on, on Wednesday night. Kings can veto a thing. We can veto things and decree it in our life. We're to reign as kings, it says. How does a king reign? A king doesn't usually go out there and scrap and fuss. The battle's won for him. Well, our battle's been won for us. It's been won for us. So we decree. What are we decreeing? What are we vetoing? Well, the same that we learned about binding and loosing, locking and unlocking, decreeing and vetoing. We veto whatever Satan's got planned against us, and we decree the word of God on our lives. We're to reign as a king. The work God did in Jesus at Calvary was much greater than the work Satan did in Adam in the Garden of Eden. God always, God always, God always, not just once in a while, but always does much more than Satan. There's much more healing in Jesus than there is sickness and disease in Satan. It says there's more life in Jesus than the death that reigned. Much more. Much more. And there's enough to turn every situation around in our life. But we have to find the word and we decree it and we veto it. Now this is important. We don't bring it to pass. God said, I watch over my word to perform it. We have dominion and authority, so we release our words, we decree a thing, and God looks after it. We're speaking God's words, and he looks after it. Like I said, our children, all three of them wore glasses. And it took up to nine months, I guess, before all three were out of glasses. We decreed the thing. And then we thank God for it all the time. They put their glasses on. We just pray. We need to be washed. We wash them up and clean them. Glory to God. Stick them back on their face. You're healed. Your eyes are healed and whole. You have perfect vision in the name of Jesus. And we told our children, you say the same thing. Don't even, well, how can I say I'm healed? I'm wearing glasses. Glasses don't heal anyone. It's got nothing to do. You just keep speaking it, and you speak it, and you speak it. You see the end from the beginning. And we saw them healed and whole. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We decreed a thing. But you see, we have to quit looking at the natural. We see it through the eye of faith that Jesus has given us. We see it through the eye of faith. We reign in life as a king. We are kings and priests unto God. And he's done it all for us. He's done it all for us. Much more life. And if there's much more life in Jesus, and it's that resurrection life, and it says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, it'll quicken our mortal body. We have that resurrection power in us. That love of God is in us. We're not trying to get it. We're not trying to work it up. It's in there. It belongs to us now. Not in the sweet by and by. I don't need resurrection life in heaven. Because I won't have a physical body that needs resurrection. I'll be there. I need it now. I need it now. We need to walk in that now. Hallelujah. That's how love, knowing and getting a revelation of what is the length, the breadth, the depth, the height of the love of God. 
Because when we do, we're filled with all the fullness of God. Yes. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Praise God.